G'day guys, Rook Shani here. Thanks for joining me for yet another news vlog. First up, let's have a look at this story involving Cricket Australia. Yes, they've joined the other woke virtue signaling institutions who are trying to cancel Australia Day. Now, it's no surprise when it comes to Cricket Australia because they're always putting their uh, foot into politics, right? The players themselves, even the organisation. So it's no surprise that they're also joining in the bandwagon to cancel Australia Day. Now, this is how they're doing it. Cricket Australia will not maintain, mention the words Australia Day on Friday during the Gabba test. Day two of the second test against the West Indies in Brisbane falls on the controversial public holiday. The decision to schedule the test over the Australia Day weekend was itself controversial, with women's all-rounder Ash Gardner previously describing it as a day of hurt and mourning. Is it lost on Ash Gardner that she's actually playing a sport uh, brought to this country by the colonialist British, right? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, it will only be marked in passing by the ground announcer and Cricket Australia is set to acknowledge that it represents different things to different people. Mm. The actual phrase Australia Day will not be used, reported the Australian. Cricket Australia will hold a standard welcome to country ceremony on day one of the test, which falls on the day before Australia Day. Now, this is where it gets interesting. The governing body consulted with its Indigenous Advisory Board in the lead up to both the scheduling and the commemoration of January 26th. I think we dodged a bullet there, right, with the voice to parliament. Can you imagine what the advisory body set up by the voice to parliament would have resulted in when it comes to things like Australia Day? We only need to look at examples like this with Cricket Australia. Now, like I said, Cricket Australia is woke institution. When the referendum failed, I'm pretty sure they were setting up uh, morning counselling sessions for their players who were in distress regarding this. Now, I'm not sure which one of these players uh, took this up, but we have seen them, like recently Usman Khawaja, Pat Cummings, who gets involved in climate change debates. These guys are all up in it. Now, Anthony Albanese was asked about this, and he didn't really address the fact around all these work corporations getting involved in trying to cancel Australia Day. He just said that Australians need to stop looking for areas in which we can be outraged, right? We need to come together as a country. Uh, speaking more broadly about the Australia Day, me Australia Day means to him, Mr. Al Anthony Albanese said it was an important day for all Australians and that he would be participating in events, but recognised it was a day when we reflect on who we are as a nation. Now, uh, very vague in many ways when it comes to the whole cancel culture around this issue. But uh, Chris Minns, to his credit, the New South Wales Premier, who is also Labour, did uh, denounce the decision, saying they should mention it. Let me know what your thoughts are. Again, this is not a conspiracy anymore. We're seeing this pile on happening, right? Sticking with Anthony Albanese, this is just, uh, just in this news, and that is around the Stage 3 tax cuts that were proposed, the promises that Anthony Albanese took to the election. Let me just quickly read this to you. Prime Minister Albanese set to propose overhaul of stage three tax cuts in broken election promise. No one is surprised an election promise is broken. The Prime Minister is poised to break one of his key election promises not to touch a stage three tax cuts with plans to restructure the plan set to go to cabinet this week. Despite insisting on multiple occasions in both opposition and in government, Anthony Albanese expected to overhaul the legislative tax cuts set to come into effect on July 1. Again, Anthony Albanese breaking election promises, a bit of a trend here for this guy. I'm sure he could end up being a one-hit wonder. Let's see what happens. Uh, this is, of course, breaking news, and I won't go too much into detail on this. Maybe tomorrow, over the couple of days that are uh, preceding this, more information will come out. Now, the next story I have for you guys is a follow-up on Daniel Andrews' business venture. That's right. Not Dictator Dan, but Director Dan now. So he set up two companies in Australia and one of them called Wedgetail Partners has a Chinese Australian businessman as one of his partners who owns one share. Now this particular individual, uh, Mr. Zeng, or known as Marty May, uh, has been working with Daniel Andrews for a long time. This is their history. Mr. Zeng, who played a key role in Andrews government's controversial Belt and Road Initiative deal with Beijing, accompanied Mr. Andrews on as many as six official government visits to China, including last year's surprise security trade mission. And he was instrumental in the Belt and Road negotiations with Beijing in 2017 and 2018. After arriving in Melbourne as an international student in 2006, Mrs. Eng worked for Labour MP Hong Lim 
before joining Mr. Andrews' office in 2014 after he was elected Premier. Six months before he retired as Victoria's leader, Mr. Andrews and Mr. Zheng embarked on a controversial secretive four-day trade mission to China. Mr. Andrews could not be reached for comment. Again, is anyone shocked and surprised that this is happening? Daniel Andrews' secretive trips to China. He's going with this particular individual, uh, Marty May, he's also known as. They've come back now. He's retired from politics. And as soon as he sets up a business, this particular individual is involved, is, is involved with one share. Come on, guys. What's going on here, right? This is I'm hearing this is part and parcel for Labour politicians, even Liberal politicians in this country, to get involved in these type of business ventures related to the type of work that they were doing while they were in government. Again, remains to be seen how this all plays out. And I'm not suggesting that anything is uh, having happening untoward here. But definitely the appearances of this and the fact that this particular individual was heavily involved in Daniel Andrews' secret trips to China, no doubt will raise eyebrows in the community. Let me know what you think you, uh, Daniel Andrews is up to in China. Someone did say that he was investing in particularly, uh, in, in, for instance, in a staircase business, perhaps, or in something to do with steps. I'm not sure, but it was funny nonetheless. Uh, the next story I have is around Microsoft being hacked. That's right, Microsoft has actually been hacked. Now, this doesn't uh, come as a surprise for those, those of us in the tech world that follow these stories to see these companies getting hacked numerous times. But these top executives micro at Microsoft, their emails were hacked by the Russians. And the reason I'm talking about this particular story is, um, it's funny, it comes on the light of the information that Australia is also in a partnership with Microsoft, right? They're investing $5 billion in Australia. And as a part of that partnership, right, Microsoft will also collaborate with the Australian Signals Directorate on an initiative, to, initiative called the Microsoft Australian Signal Directorate Cyber Shield, aimed at improving protection from cyber threats for Australian residents, businesses, and government entities. As a part of this partnership, Microsoft will work with ASD to build fit for purpose next generation cyber security solutions right and microsoft can't even secure the emails of their own top executives from russian hackers and here they are working with the government with the asd to build this cyber cyber security infrastructure in australia i don't know i reckon it'll end up being hacked by the chinese or the russians at this rate now on to some international news uh, ron DeSantis, or as trump likes to call him rob de sanctimonious has withdrawn, suspended his campaign, and will not be contesting the uh, New Hampshire primaries against Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. So DeSantis has dropped the, dropped out, and he has endorsed Donald J. Trump against Nikki Haley, telling his supporters, essentially, to get behind Donald Trump. Now, many people have been saying this is going to be happening for a while, just based on Ron DeSantis' showing and just overall enthusiasm for him, especially as they were going after, I guess, the same group, right? MAGA supporters in, in many respects. Donald Trump has come out and said that with only a few days left until President Donald J. Trump's victory in New Hampshire, we are honored by the endorsement from Governor Ron DeSantis and so many other former presidential candidates. It's now time for all Republicans to rally behind President Trump to, to defeat crooked Joe Biden and the end his disastrous presidency. Nikki Haley is the candidate of the globalists and Democrats who will do everything to stop the American First Movement. From higher taxes to decimating Social Security and Medicare and to open borders, she represents the views of Democrats more than the views of Republicans. It's time to choose wisely. So yeah, Ron DeSantis is out and Trump's lead over Haley widens to double digits in New Hampshire. So look, I reckon Trump is going to take New Hampshire. Uh, it, it seems like even if it's with a close margin uh, com compared to what people might be uh, guessing here with the CNN uh, data that's being uh, provided, it doesn't matter. If Trump wins New Hampshire, I don't understand why Nikki Haley would continue to be in this race and why all the conservatives and the Republicans wouldn't now put their uh, support behind Donald Trump to take it to the election and defeat Joe Biden. Uh, and Trump did also say uh, very nicely of Trump that he will no longer call Ron DeSantis uh, De Sanctimonious or Rob De Sanctimonious. So good on Trump. They're being very amicable now and saying that, you know, let the past be part the past. Bygones be bygones. And we need to get together and defeat Joe Biden. And the last is a WEF update that I have from you. That's right. Davos is wrapped up, but there's still lots of good videos coming out of Davos. Here we have the CEO of uh, no Novartis talking about the CDC 
and the impact that the mistrust the public has on institutions like the CDC is having throughout the industry. Let's have a listen in on this. How badly do you think the CDC has been damaged in the post-COVID? So I think it's been damaged, um, no, undoubtedly. First, I would say I think the CDC uh, is one of the most uh, you know, outstanding mm -hmm. epidemiological and public health organizations in the world. I mean, when you meet the scientists there who I've had the privilege of knowing for, for I mean, a few decades now, I mean, these are outstanding, outstanding scientists. I think they got they, they got caught in what exactly we were we are talking about here, which is a moment when we had relatively little knowledge in not being transparent about what we knew, knew and didn't know. Uh, we made declare what was perceived as declarative statements, and then had to keep revising those statements. And how fast then the trust was lost. So I believe the trust can be built back steadily over time. But it's a it's a very cautionary tale that if you're not upfront today about what is really the facts. You mentioned the distancing. We can talk about masks. I mean, I've sat with governors in the United States and the level of distrust right now of the public health establishment in the U.S. on vaccine mandates, on mask wearing is, is it's incredible, right? I mean, and but I think it's going to take time to, to rebuild that. Look, I think it's important to know that no one made the CDC or health authorities in Australia or any other country make these declarative statements so precise in, in the way that they were saying things, right? Like even just something as basic as two weeks to flatten the curve. These are the types of statements that these organizations were making. And we've found time and time again that these statements didn't stack up, right? And it's not just statements. It's just the basic science that they presented sometimes as well, right? When it's been tested now, time and time again, these organizations have come up short. So no doubt there's a lot of community mistrust when it comes to these organizations. And even Bill Gates, during an interview with Bloomberg, is feeling the heat now that he has become the face, him and Anthony Fauci has become the faith, the face of mistrust in the science industry, particularly around vaccines. Again, I think Bill Gates only has himself to blame. Let's have a listen in on what he has to say. COVID has also changed our relationship to, to healthcare. What, what does that mean for vaccination hesitancy in developing countries and developed nations? Well, the, you know, the misinformation about vaccines uh, and associating certain people like myself or Fauci having malign intent with vaccines, that was most acute in the United States. But uh, the pandemic, which you would have thought, wow, global health research to talking about health, being ready for the next pandemic, you know, when you've got millions of deaths, isn't that, you know, it's sad, it's tragic, but isn't it at least there a benefit that health is on the agenda? Sadly, it's a topic nobody wants to talk about because it was painful, you know, it's over, uh, let's move on from that. And even the idea of, okay, the importance of WHO, the importance of vaccine, re importance of vaccine research and telling people... Just, just give it a break, Bill Gates, right? Just give it a break. Poor guy doesn't even have Epstein's Island anymore to go have a break in like he'd normally have his holidays. Right now, he's just here lamenting about the fact that him and Fauci are to blame for a lot of the issues that we have around the world, that, as in we're complaining about them and he's not happy about that. Give it up, Bill. Give it up. Now, the last story that I have, guys, is around the protest that I was talking about yesterday, the docks at the docks in Web Dock here on the port, in the ports in Melbourne. We did have these protesters there almost for four days straight. They've been blocking the access to the ports there. Police have in the last couple of hours moved in and moved them on it appears like so i'm not sure if they're another you know intifada or whatever that they're calling it will take place in front of the docks there but they have been moved on um so yeah that's my news update for today if you're enjoying my videos guys you can follow along at the real rukshan on x at the real rukshan on facebook youtube rumble um, all those platforms i'm there if you're watching on youtube hit the subscribe button you can also hit the notification bell if you want to get updates as soon as I post something. But yeah, enjoy the rest of your Monday night. Take care, guys. Bye.